Um, let me introduce myself. Uh, so my name is uh, Bartek Shurgat, and I'm usually dealing with a lot of different stuff, but uh, I'm actually professionally mostly focusing around um, programming in C++ for different platforms and Linux operating system. And actually, it's because of Linux where I got my nickname from. So if you concatenate two first letters of name and the surname, uh, it actually is a Polish written pronunciation of a bus shell in Linux. So a friend of mine just noticed it, one of the companies I work for, and the nickname just kind of stuck to me. Okay, but just enough about me. Uh, about the logging part, uh, probably some of you are uh, already wondering if this will gonna be just another talk about yet another logger, because probably if you are working uh, on any distributed system, you do have a logger. So uh, for those of you who are asking this question, fortunately the answer is no, uh, it's not really gonna be about uh, yet another logger. It will be about logger, but it also will be about the logging concept that I actually think uh, should be changed. So it's in a sense, it will be kind of, uh, we're doing it wrong uh, kind of talk. Okay, so, but first, let me actually give you a personal story, uh, how I actually started to think about different, uh, doing logging a different way. I was once working in a company, uh, there, was, there was a distributed system, it was an embedded device, um, a power PC, I think, and there was an addressing scheme using two bytes, and the certain bits had a meaning, it was uh, topology related, where a given node is located physically in the hardware. And so it was very convenient to write it in a hexadecimal, because you could actually see which bits are on, so you could like physically locate the element uh, on, the, um, on the motherboard um, of, the, of the device. And it was cool, because when you had a lot of logs, you could actually grip through it, and the pattern was fairly unique, so like 99% of the catches were exactly what you're looking for. But there were problems, because hexadecimals in a text file can be written uppercase or lowercase. So you had uh, one exception. Then it turns out that when the number is small, the question is, shall you have leading zeros or not? And as you can imagine, 50-50, depends on the developer, right? Uh, then some people got lazy, you know, it's hexadecimal, so why just did not ignore the OX at the beginning, right? Everyone knows that. But then the patterns like 42 doesn't really look that unique in logs anymore. And to make things even funnier, some people think that, uh, you know, uh, putting things in hexadecimal is for machines, not for humans, and they just write it in a, just like a decimal um, uh, representation, which is completely unreadable if you are looking for certain bits on and off. And last but not least, definitely my favorite, and if you are wondering, this is a signed integer representation of the number above, right? <laughs> so if, you're, uh, if you see all these patterns daily and you're struggling through going through the logs, looking for a certain elements with all of these exceptions and probably some more I have just missed, you think, okay, we're done. And this is actually the point when I realized that actually we are doing logging at scale in a very wrong way because we are trying to solve this sort of problem. So there is probably something behind the scenes. But logging itself actually is really huge, enormously huge topic. Uh, so today, we're gonna actually narrow down it a little bit. So whenever you're talking about logging, there's always a generation, so some nodes that actually generate logs. Uh, then there is some transforming, so some facility that collects logs from different uh, parts of the system and uh, put it uh, into a common format, so this can be actually done with a log stash, for instance. Then for indexing and gathering logs, you could use um, um, uh, you could uh, you could use uh, Elasticsearch, and then finally for visualizing certain things and analyzing, you could use Kibana. So today we're gonna just talk about the basic uh, part. Sorry, not the basic, the first uh, element in the chain. So generation of the logs, and of course this is a C++ talk, so all the code examples um, and ideas will be presented um, in C++. So first, let's start to uh, let's uh, talk about what a log is. So. When I say a word log in terms of computer system, what are you thinking about? Like most likely you think about something like this, you know, like big text files with a lot of entries. And the funny thing is that this is actually not a log. <laughs> uh, log is a data structure. Log is a data structure containing of events organized by time. And note that it says absolutely nothing about the format, uh, how it is displayed, how it is saved. It's a data structure organized over time. And that's it, nothing more. If you'd like to learn more about logs as a data structure, there's actually a great book by Jay Krebs, I Love Logs. The guy was uh, chief architect in LinkedIn. So when, when it comes to infrastructures at scale, he really knows what he's talking about. Uh, but today we're actually gonna narrow it down. Whenever I'll be talking log in the context of this talk, I'll mean actually a system activity log. So entries over time um, describing what is happening in the system. So for instance, from a typical logger that we are using probably, uh, we could get something like this. Uh, so a set of common fields at the beginning, like some timestamp, a priority on the log, maybe some other domain-specific things. And usually at the end, there is a message. So some 
plain English text um, comment uh, what actually has happened. And this is the only thing that user typically has an influence to, uh, on when logging. So, uh, what actually typical loggers look like to generate this sort of entries? First, stream-like interfaces. Probably the most common in C++ world. Uh, so, logger and then ask if we were writing down uh, things to the stream. So, uh, the first problem is if you're trying to implement that, where's actually the end of the log? Um, there's a tricky thing because when you have the stream operator, you only pass on one parameter. In case of logs, we would really like not to add an explicit end, like ex explicit end line at the end because then you can accidentally have multiple logs connected. You can circumvent that with temporary objects and so on, but it's not really a nice solution. Another very common thing is how many of you can see a typo in the log? Hands up. Okay, one person. Okay, it's a very stupid thing, but there's actually a space missing after is colon. So the string will get concatenated. And it's actually a very, very common thing. And if you have like words, uh, like the answer, if it would be a string, you could then just get a glue up of text together and it's really hard to read. And it's very common, why? For a very simple reason. People, it's very unnatural for a, pe for a person to write a space at the beginning or at the end of the string, which actually stream interface requires you to do in order to keep the spaces. But yeah, okay, that's, that's a minor thing. Another interesting uh, question, uh, do you know what will be the output if answer is an integer, uh, value is 42, and my log is just a regular C out? Do you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's tricky because one of possible answers can be 2a, which is a hexadecimal version of 42. It can be ox uh, 2a if, if you happen to be configured um, in a hexadecimal with the prefix or the same for octal display, and so on and so forth. So in general, it's not really nice because when just by looking at log, you do not really know what will be the output because streams keep state for certain operations. Not for all of them, but for certain. And frankly speaking, I never remember which of them are sticky and which are not. So some of them apply just for next parameters, so some of them for all of them. And it's kind of messy. And the last thing is translations. Uh, so basically, if you have a uh, log that will need to be localized, for instance, it will be displayed on a, for, um, uh, for, a u for an end user. Like in some domains, there is a requirement to have, um, uh, to have an audit logs, uh, which are actually to be in the local language for the given users. Then there is a problem, because you have a sentence which is uh, scattered uh, with, um, with parameters in between. So you cannot actually uh, easily change the order of things. And that's kind of problematic. So the alternative? Well, good of print flag interface. That's a really cool interface invent, uh, added actually into uh, C plus, uh, sorry, into C uh, in 72, which is the year Alice Cooper released the uh, School's Out album. And it's also a time, if you're not much into music, this is also a time when the war in Vietnam is still ongoing. So quite a long time ago, like half a century ago. And there are problems with this uh, interface. First, do you see a bug? Hands up. Okay, one person, two, three, four, five, yeah, okay. But it actually takes time, right? The bug is very, uh, very stupid because answer is an integer, as we explained on the previous slide, and this is, and we saying here we are expecting a string, and this is, uh, we are just having incompatible times, and uh, this is funny because it will actually blow up at runtime. It will not even be detected at runtime; it will blow up at runtime somehow. Maybe an incorrect log, maybe a crash. Do not know. And this is something I call accidental type erasure, because we are getting a type erasure, but we're not really expecting it. So on one hand side, we have full information, variable name, type, everything, and we convert it to some pointers and basically do everything at runtime. So like completely the other way, it should be done. But that's the way uh, how it works. Another thing, no support for non-standard types. So if you have your favorite class, a stru structure, or whatever, you cannot actually put it here because it's not an integer, it's not a string, it's not a character, and it's not a floating point number. You can, of course, explode it into a, fi a set of fields, but then it's not really logging about the, the, the given structure, it's just logging set of, uh, set of fields. So non-standard non solution. And anyone tried logging with print using templates where you have absolutely no idea what type T is and you need to log it still? And you have this cool generic function of template type of T and then a set of exceptions. So if T is integer, then use this format and then for double use this and so on and so forth. It's just terrible. It doesn't work. It just doesn't compose. Uh, some of you might say, okay, there is this variadic template thing uh, you could use. Yes, it helps, but it's still not, uh, it still does not fix all the problems because you still have a format that is checked at runtime, and we'll get back to it, but in a moment. 
And last, probably the most important problem with all of this is the output, because at the output of such logger, we'll get this. And this is exactly what we have said. This is really not a log. And uh, if you try to look at this, there are a lot of problems. At the beginning, you actually have some sort of uh, format. There is some IP address, uh, some date, time. This so looks like HTTP logs, but then there are some exceptions. So it's not always this syntax. Sometimes it's another syntax. Sometimes it's like about the error. So how do you actually look for such logs? How would you parse it if there are like, I don't know, megabytes, hundreds of, maybe even gigabytes uh, of logs coming per second? And uh, people are changing the code uh, behind the scenes. So each release, you get new, new kind of logs. How do you parse it? And uh, this is actually a big problem. In one of the companies I worked for, actually a very big company, uh, we had an explicit rule in a project, you are not allowed to touch logs. So if there is a log in a system, whatever it would state, however incorrect it would be, it can have a typo, you are not allowed to fix it. Because you never know who is uh, using regular expression to catch for this log and extract a given value. And if you change it, fix the typo, it, it will turn out that you are breaking other people's system which are monitoring the whole infrastructure, for instance, because you fix the typo, right? You try to do the right thing, but it didn't work. So yeah, so if you look at it, Again, we have a full structure information, full types. We are converting it to English string, convert, send it over the wire, and then, I don't know, try, maybe regex will do the thing. So if you think about that, that's probably not really the way we should go around. And the funny thing is that there are a, lo a lot of frameworks which facilitate and help you to solve this problem, but not the root cause. And in this talk, we'll actually try to think about the root cause and how to address it. So. Uh, I started with the list of things that I would like to fix with the, uh, in the logging. So first, I would like to have a uniform representation. So whenever I'm putting a log, um, my, uh, node, uh, my node address, I would always like it to be displayed in exactly the same format. Whatever the format is, but always uniform. So if, I'm, uh, uh, if I want to have it a hexadecimal, I will never get a negative integer number. This sort of things. Second thing. Make it machine readable. So if you have a lot of logs, you ne really need to rely on the machines to be able to uh, understand and parse your logs on the fly. You cannot do it manual. You can do it manually for R&D when you are just developing. That's very convenient, but nothing more uh, on the production system at scale. Uh, of course, user-defined types. So if user defines his big structure with 20 fields, you would also like to give it, um, um, give it a mean of uh, logging these structures with your log naturally without doing um, too much work. Uh, of course, easy to use because if it's complex and requires a PhD in chemistry, uh, no, one will be, uh, no one will be using it. And no internal state, so no things like uh, the stream things. So when you are logging, you do not really know what, uh, what will uh, be represented behind the scenes, no such thing. And whatever can be, shall be checked at compile time. So whenever you are writing a log that for whatever reason happens to be incorrect, you want, you want your compilation to break at this very point. So uh, nothing shall be derived until the runtime. And uh, we'll also add a feature for possible translations so that you can actually translate logs if needed. And by the way, there is actually one interesting thing about log translations because you can, if you can do log translations, you can do actually uh, log conversions as well. And a friend of mine was once working on one embedded system and they had actually problem with space of the program and uh, actually a really big factor was uh, strings uh, in the logs because there was a lot of communications with different systems in different parts of the network and the strings were actually taking a lot of flash space. And he realized, yeah, actually, we could just replace all the strings with the numbers, like one string, one number, and mapping one to one. So inside the binary, only logging numbers, like which string w should we take? And there was a separate binary that could uh, uh, convert it back into a human readable form. And it was ingenious, but it turned out the only component I he was working on was uh, only there it was possible to do it because they were using this kind of print-like uh, notation and all the other components were having the wrapper uh, which was using stream interfaces and there was no longer possible. So actually this translation thing uh, is quite convenient for uh, more than translations only. Okay, so these are the problems we would like to address. So what would be the expected output? First of all, it shall be structured. So uh, whatever we are logging, we should preserve the information. Uh, so for instance, uh, the representation can be just a tree. So we would have uh, different nodes, uh, different nodes with uh, different values at leaves that would represent certain properties. And when we have a tree, tree is actually very easy to traverse um, 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 in a machine processable way. And you can actually query it. So for instance, you could look for nodes, uh, which um, logs, which have uh, a temperature node 
with value of now greater than the value of normal, and this means the element is overheating. So you can actually easily write a query in a machine processable form without getting into English text uh, language level uh, that will extract these pieces of information. Now, what is overheating? Well, having these logs already in place, you can take a node element and check the CPU number three, and that's it. So we can actually create easy rules that will be able to parse your automatically generated machine-friendly logs. How do you represent tree? Of course, there are like plenty of different formats. Choose your favorite. For the sake of this presentation, I'll be mostly using JSON because it's just compact and easy to display. That's it, but you can choose your favorite as well. And the final question that I get from many people, okay, but what about these logs that we are used to, like the English text, CPU 3 is overheating. Uh, frankly speaking, this is convenient only for R&D when you are doing development and you have logs that can fit on a few screens. That's nice. So we can also support it as a, as a feature, but it's just an addition. For a production system, we always uh, want to go back um, to the fully structured element. So uh, when we have this tree, and JSON, this is like one-one translations because the log always, um, the tree will always have one-to-one -one mapping into JSON because JSON effectively represents a tree. So it's very simple, um, it's very simple translation. Now we can say, okay, so what's the difference? I ha I'm using logger and the logger is already uh, using uh, JSON output. Yeah, but the thing is that most logger will output something like this. The common fields at the beginning and then the English message, CPU3 is overheating. On the other hand side, uh, the proposed logger will actually output something like this. So we we'll have all the elements named and structured and we can easily browse through them. So if you try to use this, eh, it's kind of a problem because for machine process, like understanding um, human language is just CPU inefficient and it's basically a terrible idea to try to do it in logs. So people just fall back to regular expressions, which also do not work that, uh, that nice because people can't fix typos in the logs, you know, this sort of things. But on the other hand side, if you use a machine processable form, it feels like home, right? Uh, you, you can use any engine for parsing, uh, for parsing uh, JSONs and you'll still be good here. So <coughs> this actually opens really enormous amount of possibilities. When we actually implemented this in one of the projects I work in, uh, we realized that it's not only about logging, because when we, do, uh, when we do logging in a systematic way, it means we can also filter. We can do statistics, and when we have a statistics, we can also filter things um, and react on events easily. So for instance, if we have log like this, let's say this is some log from a REST HTTP service, uh, we can see at the end there is a processing time how long it took to process a given event. Now if you plot it over time, you can actually see that majority of the time the query gets in a well-specified bound of time, but then it suddenly starts to increase. And this is the pattern you actually might be wanting, uh, wanting to look for. If you're in, for instance, a cloud environment, this would be the signal, probably scale, uh, scale out, because you need more nodes, you are getting more traffic than you can physically process, uh, and uh, the machines are dying, so you can just add more processing power uh, to improve things. When the curves get flattened, you can scale in, remove unused nodes. So you can actually do this sort of things. If you have fixed node, you can always uh, do the other, re reacting the other way around. So you can, for instance, uh, uh, call someone from, uh, automatically signal someone from the support that system is misbehaving. Go have a look at it. M maybe something is malfunctioning. Now, <coughs> let's have a look into the um, API that we could use for that. And this is actually, idea was super simple. So let's get rid of all the formatting and just use the raw argument. So all the values that user actually is interested in. So for the sake of simplicity, we'll just make it a function um, and th there will be like a set of typical parameters like timestamp, process ID, and priority. You can put an English text if you like, but this is just for, uh, just for a convenience for uh, human readers. And then a set of parameters that you, pass, um, that you pass towards logging. And note that these are actually always uh, strongly typed. So uh, that's very easy and it always guarantees you that the representation is unified because you never write by hand CPU number three. You are passing a value of enum of CPU number three. So the, at this point, when compiler will be analyzing um, this part of, um, uh, the part of the call, it will know that this is actually an enum value. This is a temperature st data structure and so on. So we have all the type information preserved on the API level. And uh, because uh, you have um, everything as a type, you can use argument dependent lookup to actually search for a proper handler that will be able to convert a given structures into, uh, into your favorite internal representation, which we're gonna talk about in a second. 
Now, uh, <coughs> it actually turned out that uh, when you want to do translations, you need to have this English text string somewhere, and usually you also need to put in some parameters. So this formatting API will actually still need uh, in some cases. But let's make it an optional, and uh, we will, uh, in order to allow uh, translations, we will only be juggling with the parameters order. So we'll never um, interleave the string, the text, with the parameters uh, as the values. We'll always address it as a number. So an example log can look like this. Um, so this is our format string, and there are three parameters, username and some two values. And we can call $1 will be a username, $2 will be a 40, $1 will be a value of 2. So this sort of formatting, very simple thing. So we, what we do is we allow to change the order. So if this, if this string is replaced with a, with a different language, that, uh, that's OK, because th these parameters are always fixed. So we can exchange this string and put parameters into different places, and it still works. And the most important thing, we'll try to do it, we'll actually do it at compile time, so that everything here will be checked at compile time, so whenever you make an incorrect, <laughs> whenever you'll make an incorrect log, uh, you will actually, your program will just not compile, because that's actually a very common problem. Uh, people are often logging errors, something went wrong. And these are unusual situations which are often not tested well. So it turns out that you are hitting this branch of error handling, and the first, uh, first thing you do, you crash, right? Because you are not able to log a thing you actually wanted to log, because there is some error in the format, for instance. So we'll try to circumvent that. Now, <coughs> you might also be asking, Okay, but what about the common fields? If I need to pass all the timestamps, the priorities by hand, and if I have 10 fields uh, which are uh, valid for my domain, how do I do it? Shall, shall I write it 10 times? It looks like brain dead, right? But fortunately, there is a good answer to that. You can actually provide your own wrapper, like very, very simple wrapper. For instance, if we have a log function, which is a generic framework part, you can create an info function that takes a variadic template of all the parameters that user has passed, and you actually call internal log, and pass on all the default parameters that you always want to have in each and every log, and then forward all the arguments. Um, I just skip the std forward and like uh, constness and this sort of stuff just to keep um, uh, just to keep uh, examples simple. But you get the idea. And you can s do the same with the warning. Again, set of arguments and the same parameters. The only difference is that we here pass warning and here info. So you can actually you actually have another customization point. And this is al also a nice thing because most frameworks actually force you to use certain fields and only these fields. And it turns out for different domains, you actually might be interested in uh, different default fields. For instance, if you are doing distributed system with multiple nodes and IP addresses, an IP address of a node is a very important piece of information. On the other hand, if you are running on a single box, why would I care, right? Everything is running on the same box in the same process. Why would I log IP address? It will always be the same. No point in doing that. And here, you can actually select which fields are relevant uh, for your case. So <coughs> now let's talk a little bit about a logs representation. Uh, so from the logical perspective, we'll have a data structure called a field info that will have two elements. One is a tag, uh, which will tell us, uh, you can think of it as a key. Uh, what, uh, what is the thing that we are logging? And then there is a value. And the value uh, will be a variant type, which will contain a different elements. So you can have simple types like Boolean, double, integer, or more complex like string. And the one very important vector of other field infos. So this is actually the place where we are creating a tree. So we have a data structure that internally can keep a collection of the same data structures. So you can keep uh, create a tree that is as, as nested as possible and as required um, in your particular domain. The implementation is quite straightforward um, in, um, in C++. So stri um, uh, the structure field info tag, it can be just a string because nothing more is really needed here. Uh, then we have the variant to represent this, uh, this union in a type safe way, basic type string, the vector of, um, of field infos to create the tree. Let's call it a value. And then one last thing is a function called retag. Uh, it's a member function and it's just very convenient, but it's actually, um, there is actually a lot of um, mm, a lot of use cases for that because normally when you will have this field info, you would like to sometimes name it a little bit different way. And let's maybe see. Um, we'll see in a second an example how it works. Uh, but just looking at the data structure, we have um, 
field info, which, contain, which is a variant, which is a template, uh, which in then con consists of field info of other variadic templates, and then you need to, set to have a, a recursive, um, uh, recursive functor overloaded for different types to actually browse through it, right? And we said it should be simple. And when you say recursive variadic template to users, more people will be like, uh, oh, come on, guys. But there is actually good news. Most users do not need to touch it because this uh, browsing through the tree is only for the implementation when you need to generate the output out of the tree. But actually, uh, for regular user, all you need to know is that you are passing certain elements. So you need to create this field info. And this is actually very simple because uh, you can have a um, set of basic types, um, uh, a helper function, free functions for basic types like integer, boolean, double, and string that will convert into the field info and then you can build on top of it. So, uh, so uh, for, uh, let's, uh, let's take a very simple case. Let's say that uh, in, a, um, in our code we have a structure which is a username and it shall be represented in a uniform fashion. So there will be a just a string value internally, one field, but it's a name concept, it's a structure. And then we create a free function in the same namespace to field info, which takes a name as a parameter and returns a field info. And internally, all we need to do is call to field info of name of value, because this is a string, we already have a to field info for that. And this is where the nice thing comes in, the retag pattern. Uh, so normally, if we locked this, we do not know what the, string, what the meaning of the string is. So the only thing we can do is just to call it a string, but this is not really informative. But if we tag it as a name, then we know that even though the value is a string, it actually is a name. It's not a random string, it's not a poem, it's a name of a user. So with this pattern, you can easily create your own two field infos. And it actually nests quite nicely. Uh, because when you have, a, for instance, two dimensional points with two coordinates, X and Y, you can create two field info, taking a point as a parameter, and then create two field info. You can call it point 2D, for instance, and then you, pass in the collection of other field info elements. So the first one will be POX, and again, normally the type would be integer, but we know this is an OX coordinate. And the other one will be PY, uh, and you can again retarget not to integer, but to OY, um, um, o um, OY type. So effectively, you get a simple tree with uh, one root and two leaves. And this again composes. So it's simple, users do not need to tattoo it on their hand to remember, and they can build on top of it. So if someone wanted to use the point, they can use it, no problem. They can create a vector of 2D, which will consist of two points, and again, two field info, field info, let's call it vector 2D, and again, collection of field infos. So from, and again, we can retag because normally the from is a point 2D, so this would be a point 2D type, but we know this is a from point. And again, here, we know this is a two point. So we can create a field info out of it naturally, and uh, we can compose it as deeply as possible without, getting, um, uh, without needing to know all the details behind the scenes. And this is, this is how the tree would actually look like in the memory. Now, we ended up with the structure which has all these tags uh, scattered everywhere, and this is actually the, this is the nice part because we allow user to maintain the information about the structure they are logging and preserve it throughout the whole chain. So um, when logging to serializing, ser sending over a wire and then deserializing on the other end because it, because it has a preserved um, format. Now, the second API I was talking about, the one with the formatting that we'll use for translations. Uh, there is this guy called Dave Grace, a uh, software consultant, uh, who said, never put off until runtime what you can do at compile time. And this is actually when the C++ flourishes, um, because you can do very interesting things uh, with the formatting. So let's assume we have an overload for the log, log function, which will take a format, which will be an integer structure, which is an integer of, um, uh, sorry, template of integer n, where n will be a number of unique parameters for this particular template. Uh, then there will be a, uh, all the remaining set of parameters for this format. The first thing we can uh, naturally check internally is if the, this n, so number of parameters expected for the format, is actually equal to the number of formats that user has passed in. If these two numbers uh, do not match, this is actually the first uh, check we can do at compile time and already say, no, your program is incorrect. You have just uh, um, set in the format you are expecting five parameters, but you have provided just three of them. So it's incorrect. And th this is uh, something that stops the compilation. And if it works, then we can proceed with the regular formatting, strings, concatenations, you know, all the stuff. So 
how do we actually do this, uh, uh, this uh, string parsing thing? So we'll uh, create a helper const exp function called format check RIT, which will take a regular C string as a parameter because we'll uh, because this is a const exp function, so we'll try to process things at compile time here. Um, we can create a helper function unique arguments, so it will take this um, um, this parameter and go through it and extract how many unique parameters uh, do we have. We'll not get into details of this function; it's, I think it's pretty much straightforward. And if the count is zero, so the format has no parameters, that's that's very simple, fast forward. Uh, but then, uh, when you actually have some parameters, you check what is the index of the last parameter you are referring to, and then you can compare if the number of um, expected parameters and the index of the highest parameter plus one are not equal, this means we have a hole somewhere in between. Like for instance, someone asked us uh, uh, to parse the format with dollar uh, zero, dollar two, but has missed the dollar one. So we clearly have a mismatch here. So the format, um, uh, th this format would require user to pass in extra parameters, which are not really used anywhere. So this looks kind of dummy. And this is the place where we can raise uh, an error. And this is the fun part. Throwing std runtime exception, uh, runtime error uh, here, but we said it's a context function. So, yes? Uh, uh, then the remaining parameters shall not be pa uh, shall not be added um, uh, at all to this formatting. You can put it like before the format so that they are still locked, but they should not be a part of the formatting itself. Because w whenever you are referring to non-existing parameter or require user to add a parameter which will never be used, then there is something wrong here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, and th that's an error because uh, when you when you are asking for a parameter number seven, but you are logically expecting just three parameters, for instance, that means that user will need to answer, uh, insert uh, four or five other parameters in between just to make the index match. That will be quite unusual, I would say. <laughs> okay, so uh, going back to the fun part. So throwing inside a const exp function, who knows what it does? Maybe, maybe first thing, will it even compile? Okay, one hands up. Okay, this is actually the funny thing. Uh, Constructs functions are can be evaluated both at compile time and runtime, and but there is a difference. Uh, throwing an exception is perfectly fine at runtime, and this will compile if this function is called at runtime. But if it is called at compile time, then throwing an exception means we are trying to do something that is not supported and language explicitly says this is an error and it requires a diagnostics. So what compilers will do, if you actually, inside the const exp context, if you hit this situation, you will actually get a beautiful call stack print from the compiler saying you are called this function, which called this function, which called this function, and it tried to throw and this will not compile. So actually with throwing inside the const exp function, uh, you can actually create another channel for diagnostic of your program. So as long as this function will be called at compile time, you're good, because you will have diagnostic out of it. And we'll actually use this feature in a second. So let's now glue it up all together. Uh, so formatting, uh, our structure template uh, with a number of parameters. Then inside we'll have a const, uh, just a regular const char pointer pointing to the format that we'll uh, like to have. And then the format macro, if you have seen some of my talks, you know that I'm not really a big fan of macros, but unfortunately there are some corner cases in the language that you can, can't really leave without the macros. So in this case, I'll just uh, remove the image and we'll proceed. Um, and this is actually the funny thing. Uh, why do you need a macro? Because uh, up until C++14, it was not really possible to put the string in two different places, and because of what can actually be a value inside the template, you can't always uh, make it a data structure that will be generated out of the other functions. So what you effectively need to do is to call the for, uh, put the format for parsing here, and the, same, the very same format put here to initialize this pointer. So this is actually when the magic happens. This is the function, this is this uh, magical function that was throwing an exception in case of the error. And because this initialized a, um, a template parameter, it means that the error will be raised by the compiler if the format is incorrect. So if you happen to have this case where indexes are not right, then 
this part, uh, this part will throw, so diagnostic will be generated. So we actually have a nice thing of detecting things at compile time. So let's have a look at some usage examples. So first one is uh, format of $1 is $0, parameters answer 42, that's okay. Two parameters, two expected, indexes one and zero, off we go, the code is correct. Uh, the second example is uh, $0 slash $0 equals one and uh, value of 42. This is okay because we are referring multiple times but the same index, the same parameter, that's good. What is not good is here. Uh, because we have this dollar zero and dollar two, but we are not referring uh, to dollar one. And this is exactly the case you were asking about. Uh, so if, if this format would be correct, which of course could be done, it means that here user would need to put some dummy parameter like, I don't know, ignore, don't uh, not used, and so on, just to satisfy the format. And this is why this format is actually rejected, because it just looks awkward. Um, and the second part is, um, uh, is a case where the format is actually totally correct. It's a format which requires just one parameters, and this is where the static assertion will kick in, because here we have two parameters and the format is expecting one. So here, in the case of formatting, static assert will, um, will stop the compilation. So it's cool, but it's still a little bit verbose. So again, uh, to make things simple, we can use a macro, a helper macro, let's call it log f, um, that will take a format and the set of parameters, and internally we'll do exactly this. So call the log format and forward all the parameters. And if you have a lot of this formatted logging, then it looks very simple and natural. Log f, format, and the parameters. And this is actually uh, kind of like a final uh, ultimate solution uh, to the problem because you have a format that is always checked at compile time at each and every possible scenario. So when you make a typo in a format, it won't compile. If you're missing some parameters, it won't compile. If the format is correct, but the number of arguments for the format is incorrect, it won't compile. So whenever you make something wrong, it will just not compile. Okay. Um, and one question I got uh, during uh, when I was presenting this concept uh, to the other audience was, okay, so you have just said you, you want to have all this whole fancy infrastructure just to make sure you are not really uh, producing strings, uh, like a text string, just to have a structure, and then you spend like 10 minutes explaining how to do the formatting the right way so that you effectively get a string message at the end, right? So uh, is there a problem? Well, actually not. Because uh, when you have log with a format and parameters, what you actually get at the output is this. So you get a structure with all the parameters forwarded and then additional field format which contains an English text message. And so this part is still machine processable. You can still use it, uh, do whatever you need to do with it. And this part can be a uh, uh, subject for translations. So if you want to display something to the user, uh, like the end user, this would be the field that you would be interested in, and for other machine processable, that's the way to go. So, in this sense, you are actually connecting both worlds. You have uh, human readable text on one hand side, and on the other hand side, you have a fully structured data with all the parameters and types preserved, and of course, the types can be like really, really big. It's like up to you what will you, uh, how, how big it will, it, it will be. I was once on a talk when a guy said that they had actually, they, they were doing quite a big cloud system, and they had a really a lot of performance problems in logging. And it turned out that they had a team which had one single log entry, which was taking like 50 megabytes like each entry and uh, it turned out that someone was just uh, lazy enough to put some configuration parameters which contain like the whole universe pretty much all the configuration all the system to each and every log they were producing so it was just like a like a plain mistake but yeah it might happen so for that you need to um, you need to pay more attention when doing this sort of things okay so let's quickly go through the summary. So the most important message I would like you to take out of this talk, and this, this is actually not a log, uh, this is a text file which contains some entries in English. Uh, what we are actually after is a log as a data structure, which is well explained in the book Isle of Logs by Jay Krebs. And actually it's really amazing because like, the, the book is really cool and it has only 50 pages. Like, it's so uncommon nowadays, because usually you get a book in, uh, about anything in IT and it has at least 500 pages. And actually most of it is just a pure noise. Uh, and here, this is like books of 50 pages, and it's really worth to read it twice. Because the knowledge is just condensed and it's so nice to, uh, so nice to read. And in the context of this talk, uh, actually one of the key opening sentences in the book uh, was very interesting. Uh, Jay uh, says, logs meant for humans to read are a sort of anachronism. 
And then you think about that, that's actually how we used to do things in the, I don't know, 80s or 90s. Like administrators were like literally looking log. They were starting the day and looking for logs. Maybe someone was trying to log in with incorrect password, this sort of things. Nowadays, we actually get logs that come in big, like hundreds of megabytes, gigabytes per second. Like I, I'm not even asking what's the Google scale at this, uh, at this point, but it's huge. I once talked with the guys from the Facebook and he said that they have like physically separate team for handling different types of logs. And uh, by handling, they do not mean reading it. They mean preparing the infrastructure to process it. So at scale, there's like, really, really big thing to address. So in order to, um, uh, to um, keep your infrastructure maintain maintainable, you need to keep logs structured so that it's machine readable and you can automate and you can detect this sort of anomalies in an automated fashion so that no human interaction will be required. And this actually kind of goes back to what Odin has just said, that there are system, uh, systems where actually human interaction is really bad. You can press OK on your laptop or on your uh, mobile phone, but if you have a machine that, is, uh, that needs to process data constantly, you cannot really ask someone to press OK button and restart it. It just needs to work. So that's where when you need the automation. And this is interesting because it's like on a different scale. Like uh, what uh, Odin was referring was like really small devices, like microcontrollers. On the other hand side here, you have like really big systems that can take up the full server room. And actually the same sort of problems uh, appear. So in this sense, there are actually a lot of similarities between these two domains. Now, um, another interesting thing is about the speed. Uh, so whenever you are looking for a new logger for your new fancy project, you'll actually see a lot of pages and they will just scream out at you how many jillions, gazillions of logs they can generate per second. But there's actually a little bit of a problem, conceptual problem in that, because if you generate a lot of logs which are useless, you're basically doing this, right? And uh, the funny thing is that the more useless logs you generate, uh, the more useless they become because then no one will be able to read it and machines will not be able to process them up to a certain point where you can actually just destroy logs as they come because you know that no one will ever be able to read it so there is really no point in storing them. So the alternative I was uh, I'm proposing is actually to keep logs well structured so even though the concept, uh, like the, the implementation by design, it's not the fastest one because you need to preserve structure. You are physically processing more pieces of information. Uh, but the thing is that you can actually do something with that. So the logs are meaningful. And uh, when I'm saying this, one asterisk at the end, when I say it's not the fastest logger around, I do not mean it's slow. Uh, for simple logs, it can still process like hundreds, thousands logs per second on the regular desktop. So in this sense, it is fast. It's not the fastest and it will never be the fastest uh, logger around because it requires to do extra work in between. But it's worth because you can actually do something with the generated logs. And if you're interested in an example, pres um, um, example implementation, uh, there is actually one I'm, I maintain uh, in my spare time as an open source basic utilities and tools library. Uh, there's a botlog namespace um, it's written in C++14 open source BSD so you can just use it for whatever purposes you want. Um, and it contains all these presented concepts and aside uh, also the part which was not covered in this talk, so uh, all the outputs like integration with log stash, writing things to file, rotating logs and so on and so forth. So it's like kind of production ready thing. And also, uh, by the way, how many of you know what's Docker? Okay, cool, great. Uh, so this library also supports a Docker, a Docker based SDK. So you can just download SDK out of the Docker hub and just build the library and play around without needing to download or configure uh, too many things. Yeah. So generally what I presented here was both the idea and the parts of the implementation, slightly simplified, but for conceptual um, discussions, perfectly fine. Um, but the idea itself is actually quite universal and you could probably implement it in pretty much any language. And uh, actually the fun fact is that uh, C++ might not be the easiest one uh, because for the language where you have an, uh, reflections in, you could actually derive the tag of this field info, so our key in, um, in, the, in the structure, uh, out of the variable name, for instance, or out of the type of the variable. So you do not really need to uh, write that, that much code on top of it. But that's just like a side digression. Well, we'll have this feature in C++, then we'll get back to it, uh, to the topic. 23, yes. Okay, so see you in six, five, six years, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, this would be all from me. So if you have any questions, shoot. Go ahead. Yes? Uh, Uh, I, no, no, it's actually one of the one, one of the key ideas. Yeah, yep. Uh, uh, okay, this was slight. Oh, sorry, I think it was. 
Was it? No, no, it wasn't here. I'm sure I had a slide about that, but just... Okay, generally, uh, the idea is that um, uh, you can have a function uh, that wraps around uh, the logger and to pass on um, pass on the name uh, of the priority you want to log in. So the framework itself just presen just presents you the API log, and that's it. And you pass in the priority explicitly. But for your case, uh, all the c all the typical fields that you log, uh, you can just add it uh, as a list of the parameters and then forward all the parameters that user has passed. So you just provide one wrapper function uh, for uh, logging info, for logging debug, for logging errors, and so on. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. In this sense, yes. If, uh, but actually, that's a th that's actually a very good point uh, because here in this concept, you can uh, the, like the library is providing you the basic uh, fundamental part. But if you would like to have uh, something that is like maybe even completely removed, like debug um, logs, completely removed from the binary in the final build, you can still do this because you can provide a macro on top of this functionality. So you can still uh, still do this. Like the API is not restrictive uh, in this sense. Yeah, and th actually the point is that uh, in many different companies I worked in, like the logging concept and requirements were vastly different. And usually it was about these little things, like which fields are need to be logged in, shall the logs be removed, or shall they only be disabled, or uh, shall they be even disableable at all, this sort of things. And you can actually provide it just with like uh, one screen of the code, helper functions, and pff, off we go. And this is actually one of the, uh, we are, are actually exploiting this, um, uh, this functionality in the project I'm currently working on because we have some domain specific um, elements that always need to be added in certain loggers for certain subsystems. And this is how it's, uh, how it's addressed. So actually it's quite a powerful tool. Yes? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, as you said, this is a GNU extension. Yes, but that's true. GCC supports that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you, uh, um, uh, for that, you would actually need to uh, extend the compiler because with the format, this was like one of the uh, only one of the issues with the format in print flag. Uh, you still need to know what's the parameter type, and you always need uh, had the support only for the basic type, like integer, uh, C style string, this sort of uh, thing. So. Yes, but the. Mm -hmm. Uh, not really, because uh, uh, um, you then would need to have, because here you have a common representation. Now here I just use like integers and string for the case of for the sake of simplicity, but you can actually put arbitrary complex type in here. Um, when it comes to, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly, and uh, it doesn't require to change the format. In C, you would actually physically need to change the format because you would need to specify field by field each element, and the macro will not solve that. You exactly. Yes, but again, uh, then you need to provide a macro for each in particular type, so you still cannot do this in generic way. But you have to provide the implementation of the macro. Because of lack of reflections, yes. C plus plus twenty three. <laughs> yes. Uh, one question regarding the uh, informatics. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you aware of the Apple right now done in TypeScript for informatics? If you look into no. Google, no. They are using right now some TypeScript standardized to do informatics for C plus plus. Would it be great? So yeah. To look at the videos and then try to see what they do. Sure. I would happy to do that. Okay. Um, so. We have still 10 minutes break, and I see there are still questions, so it's like up to you. Maybe we can do this either offline discussions or we can proceed. Uh, lunch time. Okay. Okay. So maybe. Uh, so maybe let's make a like last question then, and yeah.
Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, there, there's actually it's actually a, like a very big topic uh, that you have just started. Uh, but generally, uh, the idea is that there is always a balance between what you do at runtime and compile time. How do you pr how do you pass on dependencies? Because using this API, you could actually uh, do a very similar API that would expand everything at compile time and create a compile time structure. This is doable. So why is at runtime? This is actually by design just to like you know like cut off all the uh, all the dependencies that are needed. For instance, now to field info can hide all the implementation details in a C++ file. So for bigger data structures, it actually uh, makes sense uh, to keep it uh, to keep elements as small as possible. So uh, th th this is a trade-off. In this sense, I'm not saying like uh, I'm right or wrong. Uh, it's uh, just about the particular design decisions. In this context, the decision is this way. But when it comes to concept itself, you could easily implement it the other way around and do everything at compile time. Uh, sorry, at run. Th uh, sorry, at compile time to generate the structures. But actually, here there is one more interesting thing. You can do asynchronous logging because when you have the structure created. Uh, then you can pass it on to another thread to actually do the final formatting and set it over the wire, for instance. And for that, you always need to have a memory allocation because otherwise uh, you, you would then be operating on the pointers that are possibly no longer there. But yes, thread local storage, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. 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 This this would be like uh, kind of like adding an allocator yeah. uh, to the concept. Yeah, that's similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so if you have any questions, then just grab me over dinner. And unless I'm running really fast, then do not interrupt me because we won't speak in the toilet. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> okay. So thank you very much and have a good uh, lunch break.